Earth hath more silver, pearls, and gold Than eyes can see, or hands can hold. Affix'd thou pleasure? Take thy fill, Earth hath enough of what you will. Then let not go what thou mayst find, For things unknown, only in mind. <laughs> The place, London. The year, 1650. The book, The Tenth Muse, lately sprung up in America. The poet, Anne Bradstreet, known by her contemporaries as The Tenth Muse. Owing to her brother-in-law, John Woodbridge, and likely without her knowledge or consent. In 1650, Anne Dudley Bradstreet became the first man or woman from the British colonies to have a published book of poetry. Born to a wealthy mother and father, she started life in Northampton, England. Then, in 1620, her father, Thomas Dudley, moved a seven-strong family to Sempringham, Lincolnshire. A father of strong Puritan persuasion, and with a keen eye for business, was selected for the high position of steward to Theophilus, the Earl of Lincoln. Anne, with her elder brother and three younger sisters, now lived at the grand estate of Theophilus, and under the supervision of the Earl's mother, the Countess Elizabeth. Anne was eight years old, but already a studious child. At her new home she had access to the Earl's vast library. Anne was at liberty to read what she would, the histories, the scriptures, and literature. Anne also shared in the teachings of the Earl's five younger daughters. In short, she had a more than satisfactory education. Further to these educational advantages, the family resided but 15 miles from St. Botolph's Church in Boston. This was, in fact, the ministry of the great Puritan preacher, John Cotton. The journey by wagon each week was by no means simple, setting off on the Saturday and not returning till Monday. Anne was a deeply earnest and sincere child, influenced by Cotton and instructed by her mother Dorothy. Anne drew comfort from reading the scriptures. Meanwhile, in that same year of 1620, on September the 6th, 102 men, women and children, plus crew, set sail from Plymouth, England, to the New World, America. The ship was called the Mayflower. The young Anne would not be aware of the hardships endured by the people on that voyage, nor would know the reasons why those who had left, had left. From age nine, Anne struggled with illness and prayed fervently to God. But as Anne grew up, her thoughts naturally turned to other things. Her father's new aide and understudy, Simon Bradstreet, would form a lasting friendship with Anne. When Anne was 15, Simon would leave the Sempringham estate to serve the Duchess of Warwick. But this may have been on the account of Anne's contraction of smallpox. Anne survived, and was thankfully not severely scarred by the pockmarks. Further to this good fortune, on the return of Mr Bradstreet to Sempringham in 1628, Anne, eight years his junior, became his very happy wife. In later years, she wrote, If ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, Compare with me, ye women, if you can. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold, Or all the riches that the East doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, 
nor aught but love from thee give recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay, the heavens reward thee manifold, I pray. In 1629, sixteen-year-old Anne and husband were preparing to flee the country amid the political turmoil from the early years of King Charles I. As with the Mayflower eight years earlier, the New World was the destination for Puritans and Separatists. Stories had circulated of a land with an abundance of fruit, fish, animals and all kinds of rich commodities. It must have felt as though they were about to embark on a journey to paradise. The ship was renamed the Arbella, a large vessel, 150 feet in length and able to carry around 300 passengers and a large crew. Provisions were stored for the arduous journey ahead and on April the 8th, 1630, off it sailed in a convoy with three other ships. It was part of a great migration to New England that would continue for the next ten years. On board was the Puritan lawyer John Winthrop who kept a journal which was later published as the History of New England. Either just before or during the voyage, Anne is likely to have heard Winthrop's famed speech, a model of Christian charity. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak the evil ways of God and all professors for God's sake. Such a speech would have given much succour and hope to the either weary or fearful passengers. Cramped conditions, stormy seas, scurvy and seasickness were common. For one passenger, the journey proved fatal. On June the 8th, two land birds were spotted, and the promised land was finally in view. On the 12th, they had landed at Salem Harbour, announcing its arrival with a cannon blast. Salem would prove to be inadequate for a settlement, and Charlestown became their city upon the hill. Death was all too common for the settlers in those first days and months. Poor diets, scorching heat and strong winds abounded. Three months into her stay, Anne's childhood friend, the Lady Arbella, whom the ship was named after, died. The lady's husband soon followed. Charlestown became increasingly unsuitable and Winthrop found a new spot once known as Trimount. He called the new settlement Boston in honour of John Cotton. The tales of abundant crops and fruits were true but the mortalities continued. In resentment of Winthrop's dominance the Dudleys had chosen to stay in Charlestown, but the poor location eventually forced them to move again. They would later set up their home in Newtown, later known as Cambridge. Anne came perilously close to death herself. She contracted tuberculosis which affected her for life. Her illness brought her closer to God. She was now more stoic than before. All men must die, and so must I. This cannot be revoked. For Adam's sake this word God spake, when he so high provoked. Yet live I shall, this life's but small, in place of highest bliss. Where I shall have all I can crave, no life is like to this. Certainly no longer a child, she started to wonder why she had not already given birth to one herself. Her prayers were to be answered, and eventually she would have eight children of her own. As life gradually became a little easier, 
and secretly turned to her childhood's pastime of writing. She was inspired by Spencer, Sidney and Sir Walter Raleigh, but particularly the French writer Guillaume du Bartas. Thus Bartas's fame shall last while stars do stand, and whilst there's air or fire or sea or land, but lest mine ignorance should do thee wrong, to celebrate thy merits in my song. I'll leave my praise to those shall do thee right, good will, not skill, did cause me bring my might. Her home started to resemble her old England. She was happier now, and more secure. She loved the surrounding nature, frequently walking through the woodlands and along the Charles River. Under the cooling shadow of a stately elm, close at eye by a goodly river's side, where gliding streams the rocks did overwhelm, a lonely place with pleasures dignified. I once that loved the shady woods so well, now thought the rivers did the trees excel. In August 1635, when Anne was pregnant and with her second child, a hurricane of biblical proportions hit the region. Ships were destroyed and more families perished. Once again, nature was all-powerful. By this time, more than 5,000 had fled England to start a new life in the colonies, and the Dudleys were on the move again. They headed north to the town of Ipswich, this was yet another perilous journey for the pregnant Anne and her child. New dangers awaited her in Ipswich, as the town was surrounded by dangerous wild animals and hostile Indian tribes. Anne comforted herself in such troubling times through persistent prayer. Another comfort was Anne's writing, but as a woman, voicing her spiritual opinions was dangerous. Another Anne, Anne Hutchison was causing a stir with her loose tongue. She ultimately paid for it with her life, following her excommunication and exile. Though life in Ipswich was challenging, there was also the chance for expansion. The two-storey home came with enough land to build a small plantation. For a growing family, self-sufficiency was of key importance. Now, being the secretary of the Massachusetts Bay Company, her husband, Simon, was frequently absent, leaving Anne with her young children at home, surrounded by wild animals and Indians. What fervent meditations she must have gleaned from the late night's fire. When would her husband next return? When would the Indians next attack? And would she dare to write and express her musings again, in the light of the recent scandals? But the poet that she was, she could not contain her thoughts for long. Thoughts which visited her in poetic form. Anne sought the counsel of the retired and learned minister Nathaniel Ward. He was the possessor of an extensive library from which Anne was at liberty to borrow. Their regular conversations may well have included the hot topic of the day, the parliamentary crisis in England. While England was on the verge of a civil war, scholars like Ward were helping to build a new state in New England. He had already written a book on the official procedures of the colony, the Book of Liberties, and was now penning a new allegory on the English political crisis. The upper world shall rule, while stars will run their race. The nether world obey, while people keep their place. It was around this time that Anne started to write her series of poems known as Quaternions. Four poems, with each poem concerning four subjects. Inspired by her father's writing, she started with the four elements. These were compared to four quarrelling sisters. Next were the four humours. The four ages of man then followed. And finally, the four seasons. Another four I've left yet to bring on, of four times four the last Quaternion. 
The winter, summer, and autumn, and the spring, In season all their seasons I shall bring. Sweet spring, like man in his minority, At present claimed and had priority, With smiling face and garments somewhat green, She trimmed her locks, which late had frosted been. With the increase of settlers, her husband was busier than ever. My head, my heart, mine eyes, my life, nay, more, my joy, my magazine of earthly store. If two be one, as surely thou and I, how stayest thou there whilst I at Ipswich lie? In 1642, despite frequent bouts of illness, Anne gave birth to her fifth child, Hannah, and in August that year, the English Civil War had begun. This gave Anne a new conflict to deal with, and took to a new writing, a dialogue between Old England and New concerning their present troubles, Anno 1642. She presented England as the mother, America as the daughter. Alas, dear mother, fairest queen and best, with honour, wealth and peace, happy and blessed, what ails thee? What means this wailing tone, this mournful guise? Ah, tell thy daughter, she may sympathise. The following year her mother passed away at the age of 61. Four months later, her father remarried. With a mind to expand his estate, Simon Bradstreet and family were on the move again, relocating some 15 miles from Ipswich to the town newly named Andover. The Bradstreets were a family well off, but it was a lonely outpost which did not gentle her continuously anxious condition. Anne's new brother-in-law, John Woodbridge, had just graduated from a newly founded college, called Harvard, and was set to become Andover's first preacher. But soon both Woodbridge and Ward would be summoned to the English capital to aid in the present political crisis. It is on this voyage that John Woodbridge took copies of Anne's manuscript poems with him. With Woodbridge in England, later joined by his family, but no longer able to help in his intermediary role to the king in England, Woodbridge set about trying to find a publisher for Anne's poetic works. For many it was hard to believe that a woman could write such lines, so rich in content, so decorous in verse. Soon Nathaniel Ward joined the task, and after publishing his own political allegory, The Simple Cobbler, Ward was able to persuade his own publisher to print Anne's works. He needed a title for the book, and as Anne had referred to the Nine Muses in her prologue, then thought he, why not call her the Tenth Muse? Of course, all this was done without Anne's knowledge or consent, and so this little book in 1650 became the first volume in circulation ever to be completely dedicated to a woman's poetry. Following the recent shock of Charles's execution, the book had a hugely positive reception. When congratulations started to come Anne's way, she must have been somewhat confused and dismayed. Her work had been printed unedited, with her own mistakes as well as the printed errors. All she could do now was to produce a corrected version, and started by writing a new poem, comparing her published poetry of an ill-formed offspring. New additions to the Bradstreet family continued to arrive, but in the summer of 1653 her father, Thomas Dudley, died at the age of 77. Anne loved him and grieved for his death, but she had feared him also, for he had been of a stern and uncompromising nature. 
He had served as governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony four times and had signed the founding charter for Harvard College. Above all, Anne admired his virtue. He was a true pilgrim at heart. By this time Anne was a mother of eight children. She was in her early forties and physically very weak. She constantly lived in fear of death and in fear for her children's fate. Her husband was frequently absent from home, and while letters of high praise and adulation arrived at her door in respect of her newfound fame in England, she was too unwell to even read them. For five long years she had struggled with fever, but eventually her condition improved, and soon would come the time for her chicks to fly from the nest. I had eight birds hatched in one nest, four cocks there were and hens the rest. I nursed them up with pain and care, nor cost nor labour did I spare, till at the last they felt their wing, mounted the trees and learned to sing. Such lovely poems as this must have been a way to console herself and dispel her fears while her written meditations and all things divine and moral helped to sharpen her spiritual philosophy. In 1660, the news had reached Massachusetts that the exiled King's son, also named Charles, would be offered the English throne, following the death of the Lord Protector Cromwell in 1658 and the ensuing problems his son now faced in Parliament. It was obvious to Anne who would be called upon to travel to England to represent the colony. Such journeys by sea were frightening at the best of times. To go in midwinter was fraught with danger. Lord, be thou pilot to the ship, and send them prosperous gales. In storms and sickness, Lord, preserve, thy goodness never fails. It was often upon her husband's leaving when Anne would feel her worst. After four months of fever, her health improved on the return of her eldest son from England. On the very day when Simon Bradstreet arrived in London, in April 1661, England was crowning its new king. But whilst the restoration of the monarchy was no longer in doubt, Simon's task to persuade the new king to ratify the charter of the colony was. Eventually the new king did agree to the renewal of the charter, only it came with a number of unwanted changes, such as changes to those who could vote, and conformity to the new prayer book in churches. Simon had no choice but to accept the terms which he knew would be less than popular on his return. And after 18 months away, he was reunited with his loving wife. New England began to undergo large changes. Many men were evicted for non-conformity to the new Book of Common Prayer. In contrast, the new generations of young Americans were less principled and church attendances were down. The old days of banishment, as inflicted upon the likes of Anne Hutchison and Roger Williams, were fading, and other denominations of Christianity came flooding in. Despite the harsh persecution of the Quakers, still they came. Gradually, as the historian Paul Johnson put it, the Puritan merged into the Yankee. On the 2nd of September 1666, the Great Fire of London destroyed 13,200 houses and 87 churches, as well as the old St. Paul's Cathedral. Anne could empathise greatly with the loss, as just two months earlier, her own house, with all its history, its memories and items of worth, including no less than around 9,000 books, had burned to the ground in minutes. What poems she might have lost 
which have not been seen, we do not know. The philosophical Anne came to terms with the loss, comparing herself to Job. In accepting what she lost was God's all along. All her struggles had been God's teaching. She remained a pilgrim to the end. Thou hast a house on high erect, Framed by that mighty architect, With glory richly furnished, Stands permanent, though this be fled. She knew that greater riches Awaited her in heaven. Alas, upon that very spot Where that house had burned, A new one was built. By this time her four girls were married, while her two youngest boys remained at home. She was fifty-four, and given her persistently poor health, knew her days were few. The world no longer let me love, my hope and treasure lies above. The mother was now a grandmother, which brought her much happiness in her later years. But on September the 16th, 1672, she eventually succumbed to tuberculosis and died. At the moment of her passing, her husband, who had been away for such long spells during those very worst of times, was now sat by her side. The original site of her burial is unknown. The New England historian Cotton Mather said her poetry was a monument for her memory beyond the stabliest marble. She was America's first published poet. Her broad knowledge of ancient classics, her philosophical wit and skill of verse make her poems very approachable to this day. Her meditations and verse for both the times she lived in and the struggles she endured make for endearing and compelling reading. For both New England and Old, she was truly a voice of her age, and a voice for the ages.